You know, sometimes the, the best answer to a question is what? Anybody guess? Another question. Sometimes the best answer to a question is another question. You know, a, a theme or a topic that I know that a lot of us deal with, and it's come up in these last couple of weeks for many of you, is the subject of doubt and the subject of questions about faith, about God, about the Bible, about whether we can really know God, whether we can really trust God. Is God who He says He is? Can I really believe all this? And I want you to know that you by far are not alone in your situation. You know, one of the things that going through doubt does is it makes us feel very isolated. We sort of look out and imagine, I'm sure they never struggled with their faith, or I'm sure they never doubted, or they never wrestled with those questions, but if, if I were to ask you to raise your hands, and I'm not going to do that, of who, who has ever had doubts or questions or wrestled with their faith, this room would be filled with raised hands, including mine. And not only that, but generations before us, and even back into God's Word, we see that people wrestle with this. And, and I so appreciated what uh, Mr. Harry said and shared with us the other night in sing time about taking our doubts to God. And so we're going to continue our journey with Moses today and the people of Israel, and we're going to see a question that they asked as they once again wrestle with their faith and whether or not they can trust God. And from that, I want us to, to consider three things that I believe that God has offered us for when we are wrestling with questions and with doubt and with uncertainty. So we're going to be in uh, Exodus chapter 17 today. Exodus chapter 17. Now, if you remember all the way back to yesterday morning, we left off the Hebrew people quite what? Anybody remember what they were? Huh? Hungry. They were quite hungry. In fact, we could pretty much say they were hangry. And God, remember they, 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 they grumbled and complained and they wanted to go back right to where Egypt they had pots of meat, they thought. But God had a better plan. He wanted them to go forward. And God provided for them. He provided something called manna. And this was something that they would collect every day and from it they could make bread. And not only that, He provided quail for them to eat. So they had, they had food to eat and God sustained them and met their needs. And once again proved Himself faithful to His promises and faithful to His people. And there were a lot of issues even even with the manna, right? They, God gave them some very clear instructions and they sort of always pushed the boundaries. God said, just collect enough for one day. And they're like, ah, I get enough for two days. And then it was filled with worms and it stunk the next day because they didn't trust God for their daily provision. But now, as we come to chapter 17, they're going to be dealing with yet another issue. So let's begin in Exodus chapter 17 with verse 1. It says, All of the congregation of the people of Israel moved on from the wilderness of sin by stages, according to the commandment of the Lord, and camped at Rephidim. But there was no water for the people to drink. Now that's a big what? Problem. Right? Because water isn't a luxury, is it? Water isn't just something it's nice to have. Water is essential for life. Water is an absolute need, right? We cannot survive more than three days, roughly, without water, right? You can actually go a long time without food, but you cannot go very long without water. So they have a real concern. We're thirsty. Now, God has supernaturally provided water for them before when they were in a place where there was bitter water and God made it sweet and able to drink, so they have seen God supernaturally provide both water and food. But they have a valid concern, and they're now in a position of having to make a choice. And you know, sometimes God is going to allow our circumstances to give us a choice. Are we going to trust Him and exercise faith even when we can't see or understand how He's going to do it or why He's allowed what He's allowed? Or are we going to push back and are we going to doubt and complain and question and grumble? Now, anybody want to guess which option the Hebrew people are going to take? Option A, trust God. Or option B, grumble and complain. 
Any guesses? Somebody. Yes, what, what option? Option B. You are correct. I have no prize, but congratulations. Congratulations. Yes, let's look at option B. It says, therefore, verse 2, the people quarreled with Moses and said, give us water to drink. And Moses said to them, why do you quarrel with me? Why do you test the Lord? Right, Moses is getting really frustrated. You know, he's wanting them to come to the place that he has come to, to realize God is going to do what he said he's going to do. God is going to provide. But in their desperation, right, and in their thirst, which was very real, they started looking at things horizontally again. You see, the, 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 the challenge for us, and for anyone who wants to live by faith, is that we have to not just look at what we can see, but we have to look to God. If I just look at what I see, I'm not going to be able to have faith. I'm going to be overwhelmed. Notice verse 3. But the people thirsted there for water. And the people grumbled against Moses and said, Why did you bring us out of Egypt to kill us, our children, and our livestock with thirst? And once again, they're accusing Moses of having ill intent. Moses, why did you do this? This was such a bad idea. Why do you want to kill us? Right, and that wasn't Moses' intention at all. Moses was only obeying and following God, and God had shown himself in power and in miracles, but they were struggling. And once again, they're looking horizontally at things only. And you know, it's easy to do that, isn't it? I mean, I have been there. Have you ever been there? Right, where you look at your circumstances, you look at your situation, you look at your problems, you look at your struggles, you look at your doubts, your insecurities, and all of those things, and we get overwhelmed. And we're tempted to think, God, you've made a mistake. God, you're not there. God, are you really good? Are you really faithful to your promises? The people are really struggling, and so is Moses. But Moses isn't struggling with faith. Notice his struggle, verse 4. Moses cried out to the Lord, What shall I do with this people? They're almost ready to stone me. Right? They're, they're getting ready to have an insurrection. They're getting ready to kill me and try to go back to, to Egypt. And Moses was at a point where he was that I can't even anymore with these people, right? Have you ever had a can't even moment? Right, we're just, I, I can't do this anymore, right? And that's where Moses is at. I, I don't think Moses has any real, real doubts that God's going to provide. He's seen it before. He's trusting God. But his, his stress and his overwhelming burden is that he can't handle this people anymore. And so they are demanding Right? They're demanding to go back. They're demanding water. And can you imagine? I mean, there's, there's hundreds of thousands, if not millions of them. Can you imagine the voices that Moses is listening to and dealing with and how overwhelming it might be? Verse 5, God speaks to Moses. The Lord said to Moses, Pass on before the people, taking with you some of the elders of Israel, and take in your hand the staff with which you struck the Nile, and go. Notice that, that God does not instruct him to say anything to them. You know, sometimes we should answer our critics, and sometimes we shouldn't. And Moses is told by God, just go. And he says, notice he says, take the staff in your hand. Right, the staff was the symbol of God's presence with Moses, right? That's the same staff that, that turned into a snake when he threw it on the ground, and then back into a staff when he picked it up. Right, it's the same staff that he held out and God parted the sea and so that Israel could pass through on dry land. And so this staff was symbolic of God's presence. And so Moses takes the staff and some of the leaders that were with him and he passes before the people. And God calls Moses to faith. Right, he says, Moses, I want you to trust me. I want you to obey me. I know you're struggling. I know you've got doubts about how you're going to lead this people and they want to kill you. And it's overwhelming. And I know they've got doubts and they've got questions, but pass on before the people. And so he does. And verse 6, Behold, God says, I will stand before you there on the rock at Horeb, and you shall strike the rock and water shall come out of it, and the people will drink. And Moses did so in the sight of the elders of Israel. And so God provided, even though they grumbled and even though they complained, and God God honored Moses' faith and trust. You know, your faith and trust right, are, is, is often a catalyst for God working in you and through you. Right? God chooses to work through faith. 
Right? There was a time where Jesus is in his own hometown where he grew up, and the Bible says he could do very few miracles there because of their lack of faith. And it wasn't because he didn't have the power to do that, but it's because of how God has chosen to work in and among us. And so Moses' faith is a catalyst for God's provision. Your faith can be a catalyst for God's work in your life, in your family, in your church, in your community. Never underestimate what God can do through you, right? Because his power is unlimited, right? And God can accomplish his purposes through you, even when it seems like no one else is listening or following God. And so God provides. And verse 7, we're going to get to the question now. He said, he called the name of the place Massah and Meribah because of the quarreling of the people of Israel and because they tested the Lord by saying, is the Lord among us or not? So here's the question. The people of Israel, the Hebrew people, this is the question that they were wrestling with. Is the Lord among us or not? Is God really with us? Is God really faithful to his promises? Is God really delivering us? And they were wrestling with with this question, and their conclusion had been that he was not. Even though, right, he had made his power known through the plagues in Egypt, even though he had made his power known by protecting them from the armies of Egypt, even though he parted the Red Sea, and even though he guided them with a pillar of clouds by day and fire by night, even though he provided manna supernaturally for them, even though he provided quail for them, even though he provided water for them. They struggled with doubt. Is God among us or not? And you know, many times we have that same struggle, don't we? Is God among us? We wrestle with questions. And if we're going to follow God, right, and I believe God has a call on your life, right, I, I believe that He has called you to know Him, to worship Him, to serve for Him, to live for His purposes, to live for His glory. And in order to do that, you're going to have to exercise faith. But on that journey, there will be times of doubt. And there will be times that you wrestle with questions. There will be times that you want certainty. But sometimes we have to realize that it's not having all of my questions answered that is the real need. You know, sometimes we think, if I, if I just have all of my questions answered, then I can follow God. But God's not always going to do that for you. Sometimes He's going to call you to say, I've revealed myself to you. I have given my Son to you. Right? He really came and He lived on this earth. And He proclaimed that He was God in human flesh. That He was the I Am. He predicted His death and resurrection. And He did die on a Roman cross. And He rose from the dead. And He ascended to the Father and He's coming one day. And He invites us to know Him and to trust Him. And God will not always answer all of your questions. And so what do we do in those times when we're wrestling with the tough questions? Right? Is God really with me? Does He really care about me? Does He see my situation? Is the Bible true and reliable? Is God good? Will He provide? Our circumstances, our minds can leave us wrestling with these questions. And so we have to figure out, what am I going to do? Now, chapel isn't long enough for us to fully explore this topic. But I want to give you three things. Three things that I believe God has given you and He's given me for, for those times. Three things that, that God has given us that enable us to exercise faith. Right? We, that faith is an exercise. We have to do it. Right? It has, it, faith cannot be passive. It, it takes action. So how do we practice faith when we're wrestling with the hard questions? Three things that I believe God's given us. Number one, His promises. Right? God has given us promises. And so when we're in that place of wrestling and questioning and doubting, acknowledge those things, yes. But I want to encourage you to go to the promises of God and claim them. And say, God, I'm struggling, right? I, I'm wrestling, I'm doubting, but I'm coming to you wanting to believe your promises, wanting to claim them, right? We've talked about several of them already these, these, in these chapel messages. One that I've reminded you from last week, 1 Thessalonians 5, 24. Faithful is he who calls you, who will also do it. But many of the promises of God are centered around the fact that he's with us. 
They're, they're not centered around the fact that everything will be instantly better or that we won't have problems, suffering, or difficulty. I, but one of them that I love is found in Psalm 139, verses 7 through 10. And there the psalmist says, Where can I go to escape your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go up to heaven, you're there. If I make my bed in Sheol, you are there. If I live at the eastern horizon or settle at the western limits, even there your hand will lead me and your right hand will hold on to me. I mean, that's an incredible promise that no matter where we find ourselves, no matter what situation we find ourselves in, even in the worst places, God says, I'm there. Right? And David, he said, I- I've learned that he's going to hold on to me. He's not going to let me go. He's not going to abandon me. He's not going to give up on me. And I can trust Him. And so in the midst of our doubts and our disappointment, our discouragement, our depression, whatever we might be going through, I want to point you to the promises of God and just claim them, trust them, and ask God to help you to believe them. There's a couple hymns that came to mind as I was thinking about this. And One of the stanzas, one of them written by Russell Carter, says this, Standing on the promises that cannot fail, when the howling storms of doubt and fear assail, by the living word of God I shall prevail, standing on the promises of God. And I love that imagery, right? I mean, because maybe you say, I, know, I, I identify with that, the howling storms of doubt, right? They're fierce sometimes. They're strong. They feel like they're going to overwhelm us. They feel like they're going to overtake us. He says, that doubt and that fear. But he says, I've learned that God's word is living and powerful and true. And I can stand on it and I can trust the promises of God. And so I want to I encourage you when you're struggling to run to the promises of God. One of my favorite hymns uh, has always been Day by Day. And it was written by a, a woman who had experienced God powerfully in her life but also went through incredible tragedy. When she was 12 years old, she had been very sick. She, she was a child that did not have great health, and as such, she spent most of her time in her dad's office, who was a pastor. And she became very close to her dad. She was very sick, but when she was 12 years old, God supernaturally healed her, and she experienced God's miraculous touch on her body. But when she was 26 years old, she was with her father on a boat on a lake, And they went through a storm. Her dad fell overboard and drowned. And it was out of that. She was a very prolific poet and writer. And it was out of that situation, that painful situation, watching her dad that she loved so dearly die, that she wrote the words of this hymn. And I love the last verse. It says, Help me then in every tribulation, so to trust your promises, O Lord. Right? So she says, Help me, right? You can ask God, say, God, I I want to believe your promises, but it's hard. I'm struggling a bit, so help me. Help me to trust your promises, that I lose not faith's sweet consolation offered me within thy holy word. Help me, Lord, when toil and trouble meeting, ere to take as from a father's hand, one by one the days, the moments fleeting, till with Christ the Lord I stand. Right? You can trust God. She learned that even in the most painful place of life, that God's promises could be trusted. So I want to point you to them. God has given you His promises. Number two, God has given you His presence. Right? God hasn't just given you His promises, but He gives you His presence. He is with you. And there'll be times that we struggle to feel or experience His presence, but I want you to know He has not left you. Right? God never abandons His children. And even in the times that feel dark and when God seems distant, and there will be those times, you might be there right now, you may experience it in the future, where you say, I just don't feel God close to me. I don't sense His presence like I used to. I don't, I'm struggling. And maybe then you're saying, well, maybe it's not real. No, God is real and He is there. And so in those moments, I want to invite you to go to Him in prayer, right? And say, God, I'm struggling, but I know you've promised me your presence, and I'm coming to seek you. Would you reveal your presence to me? Make yourself known to me. Go to his word and read his word. His word is, is, is living. It's powerful. God speaks through his word. And so go to God's word. And then worship. We talked about this last week if you were here. That even in our worst moments, and even in our darkest places, 
God calls us to worship Him. And there's something powerful that happens when we worship God. Not only are we glorifying Him, which is good and right, but it does something to us. Right? It reorients our mind. It reorients our heart and our thinking when we praise Him and we worship Him. And so if you want to experience His presence, right, go to Him in prayer. Go to Him in His Word. And go to God in worship. Right? Don't, don't stop worshiping. He will make Himself known. Hebrews chapter 4 Verse 16 says, Let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence, so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in our time of need. So God invites you. God invites you to come confidently and boldly to Him, to come with your doubts, to come with your fears, to come with your anxiety, to come with your questions, and to seek Him. And He offers you grace, and He offers you mercy, in your time of need. And so I want to invite you to seek His presence in prayer, in His Word, and in worship. And you will find, as I have found, that God's presence is there. And it's amazing when we experience His presence even in the midst of the darkest things of life. And number three, God has given you His people. Right? What does He give us when we're doubting, when we're struggling, when we're wrestling? He gives us His promises. He gives us His presence. He gives us His people. Right? Isn't it amazing that that God says, not only am I with you, and I'll never leave you and never forsake you. By His Spirit, God lives with every one of His children. Right? He lives in you. He dwells in you. He's always there. But God knows that we also need people. Right? He created us that way. And God often sends His mercy and His grace and His goodness through others into our lives. And so... When you are doubting, when you need encouragement, when you're having tough times, don't isolate yourself. Right? Go to someone that you know, love, and trust. Right? A friend, a parent, a pastor, somebody that you know and love and trust that is safe. And say, I'm struggling. I'm doubting. I've got questions. I'm hurting. I'm going through a painful place. I'm overwhelmed. I'm struggling with my faith. And go to someone and let them minister to you. Let them encourage you. 1 Thessalonians uh, chapter 5, verse 11. Paul is reminding them about the hope of their salvation, about the future that they have with Christ, the fact that Jesus died for them, and that whether they live or die, they're going to be with Jesus. Right? That was Paul's hope. Right? That whether I live or whether I die, I'm going to be with him. You know, he once said to live is Christ. And to die is gain. Right? So he says, man, whether I live or whether I die, it's all good because I'm, Jesus is with me now. And when I die, I'm going to be with him. But he said this in verse, 1 Thessalonians 5.11. Therefore, encourage one another. Right? He, he knew that, man, we need encouragement. Encourage one another and build each other up just as in fact you're doing. He was affirming that they were doing that, but encouraging them to keep on doing that. He says, encourage one another. Build each other up. And so this is not only a reminder for us to seek others when we're hurting, but to be available for others when they are. Right? To realize that God might want to use you to encourage someone. Right? To build up their faith. To share your story. To pray with them. To just be with them. To point them back to truth. This question, this question of, is the Lord among us or not? It's a question that the Hebrew people were wrestling with in the wilderness. Is God really with us? And it's a question that that you and I have to wrestle with as well. Right, because when we come to those places of doubt, when uncertainty overwhelms us, and when we're in that place, We have to wrestle. Is God real? Is He really who He says He claimed to be? And is He really with me? And then I have to make a choice. Am I going to trust Him or not? God has given us evidences to trust Him. But it still requires faith. It still requires a choice. And that doesn't mean that instantly all the doubts will go away. It doesn't mean that instantly the wrestling will all just dissipate. But I can promise you this. When you honestly go to God with those things and you seek Him, He will reveal Himself to you. And He will make Himself known. 
And so I want to remind you that God's given you incredible promises. You can trust them. You can claim them and you can believe them. He's given you His presence. And so seek it. And He's given you His people. Surround yourself. And with those things, I believe that we can go forward by faith. And so I know those questions can be painful. Sometimes we feel ashamed. Sometimes we want... Listen, if you have doubt and you feel bad about it, that's just an amazing sign that you love God. Right? And that your doubt is, is just a wrestling that you're going through. If you have serious questions, it's okay. Take them to God. He can handle them. He loves you. He is with you. He is among us. And He's calling you to take that step of faith and trust. Let's pray together. Father, we pause and come before you this morning realizing and knowing that we are fallible, finite creatures. Father, we wrestle with thoughts and doubts and questions. There are things that that happen that we don't understand. There's things that we see and experience that make faith very hard for us. Father, we are people prone to, to, to look horizontally and just look at what we see and become overwhelmed and cynical. But Father, I pray that you would, you would give us the faith to look up and to see you, the God who created us and formed us in his very own image, the God who sent his son to die for us because you loved us and wanted to redeem us and buy us out of the slavery of sin and to set us free to know you, to worship you, to live for our purpose, and to live with you forever in your kingdom and glory. Father, I pray that when we go through those seasons of doubt and wrestling and questions, that we would indeed look up to you. And that by your grace and by your mercy, you'd let us see you. Father, I pray for everyone here this morning. I pray that wherever they're at in their faith journey or whatever questions or doubts or things that they might be wrestling with, that you would give them the faith to trust you. And Father, I know that it might not all go away right away, but I pray that while they're here in this place, you would reveal yourself to them. That they would be able to have a revelation of their knowledge of you, a revealing of who you are. That you would open their eyes and their hearts to you. That they would see you and be able to trust you. And God, that you would lift them up out of that doubt and out of that fear and out of that uncertainty and give them great confidence in their walk with you and their knowledge of you and their hope in you. Father, thank you that you are patient with us. Father, I thank you that you remember that we are frail and weak. I thank you that you're abundant in mercy. I thank you that you remember that we are made of dust. You're patient and gracious with us. And Father, we thank you so much for that. Father, I pray that you would work powerfully in our lives to give us confidence and trust in you. We ask your blessing over this day, over our activities, our practice, our rehearsals, our work, our free time. May we do all of it to honor you and to glorify you. And may we encounter your presence as your people together today. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.